Welcome to episode 182 of Wealth Talk. My name is Christian Rodwell, the Membership Director of Wealth Builders, and I'm joined by our founder, Mr. Kevin Whelan. Hello, Kevin. Hi, Chris. Good to be with you again, as usual. Yep. Feeling refreshed from your break? Yeah, refreshed, recharged, ready to go. And um, look, every couple of months or so, I like to do something that just gets my own batteries recharged. And it's also a reward, isn't it, for, for doing good work. And I like to do that. So... It, it can be golf, which I love, as you know, and I was in the Carolinas playing a little bit of golf. 72 degrees, much better than the terrible weather we've had here. But if it's either golf or uh, nice food, nice wine, or, or even I love a bit of nature as well, whether it be Scotland or whether it be Scandinavia or whether it be American or whatever. And by the way, Super Bowl's been on as well, which was, which was good fun. Uh, so yeah, lots of good things, Chris. I love sport too. And uh, you and I both being mad football fans, aren't we, as well? So, yeah, all of those things I love to do. But thanks for the question. And while Factor 50 is uh, definitely something that's important to me, given my Celtic colouring, even in 72-degree heat, I don't look like I've been anywhere, but believe you me, I had a good time. Yeah, we're back to it now. And uh, I should just mention as well, we've got our next webinar coming up next week, which is on Tuesday, the 21st of February. And this is going to be a webinar all about SAS pensions. It's how to fund your property portfolio using your pension. Any uh, little teasers, Kevin, of what people might expect on that webinar? Well, you know, the big thing for me with SAS is it's, it's, it's leverage. And that's a big theme coming out of today's conversation. And it's the leverage of being able to transform something where for most people pensions are on the do not disturb till 65 list right it's something that's there in the background it's in a box in a folder in a file somewhere but it's not part of their life it's a part from their life for the most part and in fact chris um as you know i'm writing a book um working title pension chaos while the whole pension system in the uk is broken and what to do about it and uh, this is part of the problem and what SAS does, the small self-administered scheme, well known by good, you know, avid listeners to the podcast, it allows you to turn your pension money into money you can use to build wealth for you today. You don't have to wait till you're 55 or 57 or 65. You can use it today. And property is a great one, but you can use it to help your business, buy a franchise. You can use it to buy funds, but as a wholesale customer instead of a retail customer. So you're paying a fraction of the price. I did a little post on the Facebook group the other day when somebody said, how cheaply can you get access to funds? I said, the platform we use is 0.15. You know, and the biggest platform in the UK charges 0.45, three times more expensive, Chris. So there's so many more ways that SAS can bring really great value. So I would encourage anybody who has heard of it but doesn't really know about it, everything you wanted to know about SAS but were afraid to ask, Tuesday the 21st, um, UK time, of course. Yep, yep. That kicks off at 7.30 p.m. So uh, go and register now. Head to wealthbuilders.co.uk forward slash SAS webinar. That's S-S-A-S webinar, all one word. And we'll see you there. Okay, so today, Kevin, we are focusing on the property pillar, and uh, we have a, a fantastic guest, Mark Ferniho, who's the founder and director of Prosper Property. And this mm -hmm. is a family business. They were selling cars, and that's an industry, obviously, that's changed over the last few years. And they educated themselves in property, and they now have a thriving property business, which serves the tourist industry in their home county of Cornwall. Mm. And not just the tourist industry, uh, if I recall. I think in the winter months, they have a, a different strategy because there's less tourists, but, you know, Cornwall, well, always people love Cornwall, don't they? So it's always going to be a great place. So great for them because they've got a fantastic location. But, you know, the, the point being that it is possible to pivot into change completely. And, you know, in terms of their change, it was a complete change, wasn't it? Moving from cars to property as a whole family. <clears throat> and this is part of the the benefit of being a creative minded wealth builder, you can see changes, you're participating in changes, you know, you're reacting to changes in a way that the kind of traditional pensions industries I talked about a moment ago, don't react to anything, everything's about, don't worry, it'll all be okay in the long run, you know, stick, stick, stick with the same thing, just hang on for the long term, everything will be okay. And of course, 
as wealth builders, we need creativity and creativity doesn't come from that place. That's right. And um, there's a lot of leverage at play in today's conversation. So perhaps we'll leave the listeners with that and see how many they can uh, pick out and we'll run through that after mm -hmm. this interview. So let's head over to today's conversation with Mark Fernieho. Mark, very warm welcome to Wealth Talk today. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yourself? Yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Thank you. Pretty it's good. a Friday. So, uh, you know, spirits are high. <laughs> weekend is coming. Um, but I'm looking forward to talking to you today, Mark, because you've got really, really interesting business and one that I think will be of great interest to our listeners. And um, you were chatting with Kevin recently, weren't you? And, and Kevin kind of pulled me aside and he said, oh, this guy's doing some amazing stuff. We've got to get him on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, the compliment. Um, oh, well, yeah, I was chatting to Kevin and uh, he's sort of learned over the last year or two quite a lot about our business. So, uh, yeah, it's nice to uh, for him to for him and you to, to invite me, basically. <laughs> so, Mark, you're the founder and director of Prosper Property and uh, your tagline is interesting, protect and grow your wealth. So, uh, you know, couldn't be any more relevant, really, for today's conversation. <laughs> I'll find out in a minute, you know, what made you choose that tagline. But Let's begin with uh, just, if you don't mind, explaining a little bit about your business and what you do. Yeah, so we basically um, acquire commercial property, specifically guest houses and small hotels, to um, refurbish. So we add value through refurbishment to start with, but then actually to drop our automated serviced accommodation business model into. And um, it's, it's, it, it, it's a... A strategy that we sort of um, have come across, um, which is obviously perfect for our location. Um, and it's got two big upsides, I suppose, really. And that is um, the, the the fact that it generates so much cash flow um, running the way that we do. And it's very lean. And then also, um, because these properties are generally run by Mr. and Mrs. Guest House owner and not really traded sort of purely commercially um they're almost sort of hobby jobs lifestyle jobs um they're always valued on bricks and mortar so we sort of uh, season the income over a, a period of time two three years and then after sort of three or four years we can actually get these properties commercially revalued so there's an uplift in value on them once that happens as well hmm. so some some leverage is definitely coming into play it sounds like <laughs> yeah yeah and, and i suppose just uh, a lot of a lot of uh, adding value through different sort of streams, I suppose. Really excellent. All right. Well, we'll look forward to to finding out exactly how you're doing that. Let's come back to that tagline quickly. So, protect and grow your wealth. What what made you decide on that? Um, well, I suppose from our perspective, we are investors ourselves, um, but also from um, sort of people that we work with who are investors. It's what we all want to do, isn't it? Um, the wealth that we have, we want to protect, whether that's, uh, well, whatever that is, really. And um, the majority of it uh, want to grow it as well. It's, yeah, <laughs> simple and, as that, really. Yeah, and, and and maybe just you can add about how you go about protecting, you know, funds, because you work with joint, uh, joint venture partners as well, don't you? You raise funds. Yeah, we do, yeah. Well, I suppose uh, the great thing is with property is that obviously it's a very secure asset so to speak whether that's um sort of w whether you've got charges or not just from the simple fact of the matter that it's a property it's not going anywhere it's not getting stolen um you have it insured they are sort of historically very secure safe assets ultimately all right so Let's get into the strategy then. So you said, you know, you're finding undervalued commercial properties, then you're turning them into highly profitable service accommodation businesses. So yeah. um, you mentioned location, but yeah. let our listeners know exactly where are you based? So we're in Cornwall and we we have very specific target locations and actually locations within target towns, really, um, in down here in Cornwall. And obviously sort of Cornwall's a brand in itself in a way, really. So Four million people a year come to Cornwall and uh, the cliffs and the beaches aren't going anywhere. So it's going to continue to grow without a doubt. OK, so we'll go back to kind of where it all began. But just to give people a perspective of, you know, where is the company at now in terms of size? So we, we have about 70 live units uh, across multiple different properties. So mostly guest houses and hotels. Um, 
The value of the properties that we own and manage is about six and a half million. The majority of that um, uh, are ours rather than manage, but we do manage properties for for clients as well um, who um, who fully understand us and the business model. Um, we we only um, we only manage properties for people that yeah get it and the properties are right and uh, that they're on board with exactly what we do. Um, so yeah, uh, we've we've grown that over the last five years basically. Okay, and uh, as you mentioned, this is a, a highly cash high cash flow business. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. It's um, the the well one of the benefits is the fact that the majority of people that own these properties they. Because it's so busy down here in the summer, um, most owners just trade up to the VAT threshold and they're open for four months in the summer and they can easily get to, to that figure. And they're happy with that because they're working in, in, the, in the business themselves, making breakfasts, washing linen, changing beds, cleaning rooms. And it is actually quite hard work. Um, so they, that's the most profitable part of the um of the of the year obviously so they 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 do that and uh, are comfortable with the lot so to speak um but actually run pure uh, as well run far more commercially um you can in some of these buildings you can triple that um that that income if you're perfectly happy obviously being that registered and uh, having having a team and obviously sort of yeah, leveraging a team uh, and outsourcing stuff then um yeah it's it can be run entirely different to a sort of lifestyle job or life job, lifestyle business that most of them are yeah so obviously in cornwall you've got the, the <clears throat> tourists in the summer right absolutely packed out so how yeah. do you maintain full occupancy all year round mark yeah well it, it is very very seasonal so our rates are completely different in the winter off season to the summer but it's, it is surprising how many tourists actually do visit at off season as well um we're not we're not by any means full in the in the winter, but we do also get contractors in the winter as well because our rates are down sort of more like the the rates that contractors are sort of comfortable with. So we have a mix of tourists and contracts through the winter, and uh, and and get sort of yeah reasonable occupancy through the winter, and it is um, it is it is profitable um, through the winter, but obviously the summer is really where you make make the money, obviously. Yeah. So for anyone listening now who's perhaps got service accommodation and, and they're really finding a struggle, you know, when they've got a really busy period, then they're just completely quiet. Any tips there, you know, as to how how you went around, you know, finding those contractors or which sites perhaps you're using? I suppose we just leverage as many of the online travel agents as possible. Um, so we have our system set up so that we're on as many as possible. It's just a case of getting eyes on the rooms, really. Um, and there's various other sort of strategies and sort of, um, I suppose, um, tricks that you can sort of in, in a way do to to get more eyeballs on your properties. And that's sort of... Um, I suppose, independent of each OTA, really. Each OTA has their little in intricacies, etc. So that's something that we, 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 we concentrate on. But we also concentrate on repeat business. Um, so obviously, we market to everyone that stays with us. So if I suppose we use the on or try and use the online travel agents like a dating agency. You hope you only have to use them once for a particular guest and you want to obviously take their bookings direct once they've stayed with you. So then... Uh, yeah, obviously you're, you're saving the commission then. Okay. So would you mind, Mark, can you just maybe take an example of a, of a project and, and, and walk us through, just give us the sort of uh, overview, quick overview of, you know, how did you source it? How did you find it? How did you negotiate? You know, what kind of revenue perhaps was that business doing and, and what were you able to turn that into? Yeah, sure. Um, we source properties in different ways. So we we have relationships with agents. We also sort of um, yeah scrape. I say scrape, but obviously uh, yeah, I suppose scrape the um, the portals as well for properties that are actually advertised. And my team do that for me to save me time. Um, and then we also uh, send letters out to owners of these guest houses and small hotels as well, so that we we sort of go direct to them and. We've sourced them in all of those different ways, basically. Um, but once we've um, once we've acquired the property, well, actually, before acquiring the property, ultimately, we've got to agree a deal. And um, everyone's circumstances are always very, very different. So um, we've 
we've acquired properties on uh, lease options. Um, we've bought properties outright using investor funds. Um, we, again, manage properties for, for, for the odd client as well, um, people that maybe had the, uh, the property on the market, but it was, it was on the market for a specific reason. And then we've sort of worked out that actually um, it suits them um, if they actually keep it and we manage it for them because that actually solves their problem. So there's lots and lots of different things that we can do to just make sure that a deal works for everyone. Because ultimately, if it doesn't work for them or it doesn't work for us, then it's it's not going to happen. So it's just a case of, uh, yeah, asking lots of questions, finding out actually what people really, really well, what they want, um, what they need and seeing if we can help, basically. Mm. And I've seen, obviously, some of your pictures of the before and after, and it's quite a transformation. So you obviously have a good team who can go in and, and turn that around. Um, you know, do you, how much kind of resource and investment do you put into your refurbishments? Um, also, well, ultimately, it depends on what the property's like to start with. So some properties will go in there and literally gut them um, and replace all of the en suites. Um, some properties, um, we're only adding extra rooms because actually the en suites and the, the rooms that are there are, are nice. Um, so we will... Obviously, if we can save save money or not spend money, um, we, we will, obviously. It's just a case of getting them up to a certain standard um, and in the specific, um, I suppose, layout or model that we need to run our our business model in there. So, yeah. Okay. And, and, and something I'm really interested in is, is the, like the automation, the systems that you've <laughs> created, Mark. And, yep. um, you know, explain why this is so important and, and give some examples of kind of the areas where you've, you've really minimized the amount of kind of, you know, human resource and touch points. Yeah, I suppose um, systemization and automization is key to our model. Ultimately, it's, it's, it's very lean, which saves us money. Uh, simple as that. So everything is self-check-in and self-check-out. So um, uh, all of the all of our communication is is electronic. Um, so it's, it's about sort of uh, giving people the service that they want, but obviously doing it in as systemized and as, as an automated a fashion as is physically possible. So yeah, self-check-in, um, self-check-out. Um, we still have a phone system so people can contact us uh, and that's um, but again that's very very systemized as well with lots of different messages and we've tweaked that over the over the years um, initially a long time ago we said we're not having a phone system we're going to be completely electronic but from a customer service perspective we realized that actually we do actually need to be contactable uh, for certain things because obviously it's a hospitality business. You want people to have a great, um, great service. And if something happens, if there is an issue, which there obviously is always going to be issues um, for whatever reason. Um, if yeah, a light bulb's gone in their bedroom, for example, or something, they need to get hold of someone quickly. So um, being, I suppose, um, too remote is obviously a bad thing. So we found that balance now. We think we found we think we found the perfect balance, basically. Yeah. Now I'm sure it's not you that's jumping up and, and running to go and change the light bulbs uh, these days. No. Although maybe it was back in the beginning. Um, so let's talk about the team now, Mark, because you've got two, um, you know, co-directors, uh, business partners, yeah. and um, you know, how did the three of you work together? It's myself and. Um, my dad and my brother, basically. My dad doesn't, he's sort of more of an advisory role, he's retired. Um, so my brother runs the whole sort of maintenance and operations side of the business. Um, and his, he actually does, he loves running around and actually doing jobs. So although he's uh, the director, he actually is the, the Mr. Fix-It as well. And then we also have other people on the team um, that sort of help with all the sales and marketing. Um, the systems and the operations side as well. So people that we've worked with for quite a few years who help us set all of that up. And then we've got a uh, customer service team, which we employ, which are actually um, uh, VAs uh, abroad. And obviously we have systems in place to obviously um, communicate with them all day and every day. And they run off the back of our systems and processes. So they do all the customer service basically. Um, and then we've also got housekeeping team as well, 
which is all outsourced to a local company that we've worked with for, for years now. So they also work off the back of the software. So every day they know exactly what needs to be done in what property um, because that's all um, in the software. And then obviously in the messaging systems through our project management, if the VAs need to get hold of housekeeping teams, they'll communicate through the project management software. So um, yeah, we think we're, we're, we're certainly pretty efficient, but there's always room for improvement, obviously. Yeah. So leveraging systems, um, maybe you could share a couple of the, the software systems that you use that you find really helpful. It might be a, a you know, good tip for our listeners. Yeah, sure. Well, I suppose our entire business, as far as the project, as far as everything, actually, it lives in project management software called Asana. Um, it's, um, yeah, I suppose there's loads of different bits of software out there, but it's something that uh, we came across through a program that I did sort of many years ago. Um, I, we invest a lot of time and energy into act, into, into training and, and, and learning. And um, when, before we set the business up, we uh, went through, or I went through a program to learn how to systemize and outsource in this day and age, really. And it was actually um, that program that recommended lots and lots of different types of software for different things. So Asana is the main one. We use LastPass to share all the passwords because obviously everything is online these days. And there's so many of us obviously logging into different things. So to obviously keep all the passwords secure, we use LastPass. They're just, they're two that we use at a very high level, I suppose. They're the ones we use the most, basically. Yeah. And, and, uh, we, do, and we do as well, Mark. So uh, I, I can definitely, I can definitely uh, concur that those are, those are great platforms. And, um, yeah. you know, both of them, actually, you can start using them for free. Um, yeah. and, you know, try them out. And uh, if they're working for your business, then you can upgrade. So, yeah, yeah. good tips. Good tips. And Thank you. Actually, you combined, can... com well, sorry, combined with those actually is the, the whole Google suite, basically, um, which is, uh, it's, or it's relatively normal these days for everyone to be obviously be, uh, I suppose, using using that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, it, it's we find Google far easier than Microsoft. Although we have to use that as well for certain things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we should be thankful, shouldn't we, that we're in business in this day and age where these tools just make life so much easier and yeah. um, and yeah. give us the, you know, ultimately the time freedom that everyone is searching for, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and that's the 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 kind of the test of a true business, right? Can it run without you, or are you? Mm. Is it completely dependent on you? So leveraging systems and people as you're doing is definitely the way to achieve that. Right. I want to touch on some numbers. And uh, I know compliance is something that you're very focused on within the business, Mark. And, yeah. uh, you know, having raised funds previously, uh, you've developed your own FCA compliant process, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. So we've worked with sole investors um, to raise the equity for to, to actually buy properties outright. And um, it was really important sort of before we did that to actually learn how to do it legally ultimately so we've um we work with mentors um finance mentors and sort of compliance have worked with compliance mentors as well to put together a compliant process to actually um meet um get to know um get to sort of go through the whole no like and trust process with investors in a way that is legal ultimately um before then um onboarding people and offering um, people investment or showing people investment offerings ultimately and because these commercial properties uh, people can use their pensions if they have a SAS as well yeah they yeah they, they can it's um they're all commercial from the word go so um i'm, I'm don't pretend to be a SAS expert uh, but i know obviously you guys uh, you guys are um having a SAS is something that is on my radar and we will be setting up a family SAS at some point in the next year or so um, I know a little bit about it and uh, it will suit us as directors of businesses perfectly um, to, for us to actually, yeah, invest in our own, um, our own properties. Yeah. No, I'm but sure. obviously other people, because they're commercial, yeah. can invest um, and can buy these properties with a SaaS. Yeah. So 
I guess looking at service accommodation and, and you're kind of taking it to a new level with, with the way that you're operating and systemizing it. But for, again, for listeners now, you know, a lot of people have been hit recently. Uh, those that perhaps buy to lets and we know the mortgage rates have really eaten into a lot of people's profits and they're looking yeah. now at other strategies that might return better cash flow for them. Um, you know, what are the kind of, you know, give us some headline kind of numbers that, that a property doing service accommodation could generate uh, per month or per year for someone? Um, it depends on if you're going to be managing it yourself or not, ultimately. So, so obviously, um, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of work, ultimately. Um, but And that's why most people choose to obviously have them managed um, by, um, by people like ourselves. Um, but a very high level um ebitda is around about sort of 40 to 50 percent um so which is pretty good <laughs> very good in fact so um yeah including the management fee for for, for us effectively we can um acquire a property um set it all up um obviously yeah drop our business model into it and um, yeah, our earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization will be 40 to 50 percent of that turnover. Mm-hmm. That's after all of our costs and everything. But obviously, if people want those properties managed, then obviously that does come down a bit because obviously we, we charge a fee to do what we do ultimately. Yeah. And obviously, the, you know, room rates going to be wildly different and dependent on location and, and all sorts of factors. Um, yeah. but, um, you know, again, just some, some numbers, perhaps of, of uh, you know, a, a good room, uh, high quality yeah. like yours are. What might that be generating? Yeah. So in the summer, um, obviously, every property is slightly different. And like you say, every location is very different. So we've got we've got um, properties that are sort of more like um I suppose a boutique hostel in a way, um, which aren't in sort of uh, which don't have sea views, and the rates for those sort of properties are generally around sort of forty on the off season per night to one hundred and twenty high season. Um, but then there's other properties um, with, for example, sea views overlooking somewhere like St Ives. Then the rates there um, will vary from around about seventy in the off season up to about three hundred um in the high season per night yeah yeah so, yeah so really a very broad range it <laughs> is yeah i think three just times three times something. as much in the summer as the winter as far round figures go no it's, yeah. it's good, good good to get an idea there and as you say this is a strategy that is time intensive and and will require you know you know a lot of input and and the education yeah. which you touched on at the beginning right mm. um just yeah. switching from a buy well you know a property that perhaps could lend itself to being, uh, you know, changed into service accommodation, uh, just because it could doesn't mean that you des- necessarily know how to do it, right? No, that's right. And um, I suppose, yeah, tra- training is really, really important about what you're doing. We haven't always done this. Um, I used to be in the motor trade, so we were um, had my own car dealership, and in 2000. And- 15, 16 ish, we realized that actually it wasn't going to sort of, I suppose, long term um, provide us the security uh, and the lifestyle that we wanted. So we made the conscious decision to pivot completely from one industry to another. Obviously, uh, we had a tiny bit of property experience. I had a flat that I rented out. My dad had one sort of uh, one HMO, one student house. So we invested a huge amount of time and resources into into training. So, um, yeah mentorship programs, training courses, um, mastermind programs. And that's how we managed to sort of transition from one industry to another with, with very little experience, basically. Mm. And then, so, yeah, we, 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 I suppose 2017 is when we, I suppose, well, we closed the business, closed the garage and sort of went full time into property. Yeah. Which would have meant obviously the pandemic hit during that period. Um, how did you navigate that? Um, obviously it was, was tricky for a time. No one, it, no, no, none of us have ever experienced something like that before, obviously. Um, being closed is obviously not remotely ideal for a business. Um, we would, we were, we were very fortunate in all fairness that all of our businesses, um, are 
we pay rates on all of them because they're all commercial properties. So we had government support for every property, which actually we think was very generous. Um, and then obviously once we opened, I suppose the, the, the properties burned between about three to four thousand pounds a month being closed, um, depending on how big they were, basically three to five, I suppose, the bigger ones. Um, and um, yeah, that's not ideal. But the moment that we opened up, there was so much pent up demand from people to actually travel because everyone's been stuck in the houses and no one could fly. That actually the, the, the summers, the seasons were bumper, really. Um, so obviously, COVID was a terrible time for lots of people for lots of different reasons. But it, it, from, from our perspective, I think we were just lucky that we we're in the industry we're in and we got the support. And we were able to bounce back very quickly due to the due to the um, just the situation, basically. Hmm. And finally, I guess looking forwards, you know, what's your your plan for the next few years? And in terms of supply in your area, do you feel there's more than enough properties that you can continue to uh, to you know enhance? Yeah, no, there definitely is. Um, there's it's it's one of those um, I suppose. Um, industries in a way that some that a lot of people come in they, they a lot of these owners mr and mrs they come in they do it for three four five years it's a it's a semi-retirement sort of um lifestyle move for a lot of people so then obviously when they want to fully retire these properties come on the market so there's always um a flow of them coming onto the market um and uh, yeah, that, that suits us down to the ground, obviously. So we're, we, we generally um, acquire or have historically um, acquired one of these a year, but we're looking to scale that. We want to do two or three a year, and we're, we're putting the sort of the systems and the processes and the team in place to be able to grow at that rate. Um, so we've, um, yeah, we're, we're working, as, yeah, working as hard as we can towards systemizing everything so that we can um, set up acquire and set up and fund more of these basically yeah and uh, as i said before the the properties look absolutely fantastic so you're doing a really great job uh with Thank your you very uh, much. your brother and father there so if uh, our listeners would like to take a look for themselves mark go online look at yeah. uh, what you're doing where's the best place for them to head to uh, head to our website and obviously there's loads of information on there that is literally www.prosperproperty.co.uk and um yeah there's loads of information there and they can contact us direct through the website and set up a uh, a, a, a 30 minute video call with me if they've got any questions at all that's brilliant thanks so much for being a great guest on wealth talk today mark no problem at all thank you very much for having me it's been brilliant awesome Interesting stuff from Mark there, Kevin, and lots of lessons we can pull out. Before we do that, let's head on over to Trustpilot. And uh, we've got a bit of catching up to do, actually. We've had some reviews coming in this year. I'm going to go back, actually, to January and to a review from Neil, which kicked things off, saying 2023 has started with a bang. Helen Pollock, the community support manager at Wealth Builders, has hit the ground running for me at the start of the year. I'm so grateful and I'm looking forward to my wealth journey. Thanks, Helen. Well, good for Helen. And, uh, you know, we're, that's the leverage for us of, of, of new people. And we've got, um, uh, we've got somebody else starting this week, actually next week, uh, working with Wealth Builders and somebody else in, in our IFA team. So, you know, we're, we're always taking the opportunity to, to grow by adding more quality people <clears throat> to our team who are playing full out on the team. And that's the, the sort of language we encourage people to think about, that they're just identifying with the team they want to play for and they play full on. And like any team, you're going to make mistakes. You know, you're going to do some things that are it's like football, isn't it, Chris? You're going to make a, an, an odd wrong pass or make a mistake and nobody blames anybody for that. But the leverage of doing that is great for us. And the leverage where Mark is, I mean, there's so many points of leverage there. Do you want to pick any out? As you said, you were going to test our listeners to see how many they could find. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, uh, well, you created an acronym, which we use as uh, part of our teachings, Kevin, for leverage, which is F-I-R-S-T, which mm. stands for Financial Leverage, Intellectual Relationship Systems and Time. So mm. I'm pretty sure all of those are coming into play here. And, I think uh, yeah, 
Yeah. So, uh, well, why don't we start with the financial leverage? And, um, you know, you talked about working with others. So that financial leverage doesn't always need to come from your own money, does it? It could come from other people's money. No, that's right. And, and of course, we'll be showing people next week about how the SAS pension could be a form of leverage that most people don't realize is there. And while that wasn't part of the leverage for the Fernieho family, I I'm assume it will be part of their leverage from the profits they're making as they shelter those profits from all of the main taxes, you know, including national insurance, income tax, corporation tax, capital gains tax and inheritance tax. So, you know, pretty powerful stuff there in terms of financial leverage. But the leverage they've, they've got is finding private investors. And what's impressed me with Mark is the diligence in which he's applied a thoughtful and legal process to this. You know, he hasn't just gone gung-ho and posted things all over Facebook. He's taken good guidance. He's written some good materials. Um, I've checked those materials as well. I'm impressed with the, the the degree of diligence they've applied because they want to keep themselves safe and they want to keep their investors safe. And in fact, you pulled that out straight away, Chris, didn't you, when they talked about their, um, their uh, what it the, um, the, the, the kind of the key words they use on their website. Yes, yes. Protecting and uh, growing their members uh, or, or clients' wealth. So, yeah, yeah, very key for them to protect. Yeah. Okay. So uh, other points of leverage. Well, we know that leverage really comes from either systems or people. And absolutely, they have put the systems in place here with their service accommodation business. But also, Mark referred to leveraging, you know, the VAs based in other countries to deliver the customer service. So it's a really smart way of working here. Yeah, well, of course, that gives you more time. I talked to Mark and Mark is historically was doing a lot of the work. Now he's not doing the work so he can find more deals and negotiate uh, more deals with, with other people. And I think they said their ambition was to move from you know, one significant project a year to three or four. And that's you know, quadrupling the size of your business, which means putting all that leverage in place uh, enables that to happen. So, you know, congratulations to them. And the other form of leverage, <clears throat> Chris, I might mention is um, they're not just finding their own private investors. They're also working with crowdfunding um, sites. So they've, um, they've aligned on a current project. I mean, I'm not aware of the detail of the project, of course, but but just I like the idea of what crowdfunding brings, and they're using uh, Leo crowdfunding, and anybody could check out crowdfunding because it's a place you can invest, you can almost participate in other people's projects um, through through the crowd. So, you know, you could own a part of a project for a hundred pounds, as opposed to getting involved in learning all of the project uh, knowledge for yourself, and it can build a layer of diversification, whether you've got a SIP or whether you've got a SAS or whether you just want to invest through your innovative ISA, uh, you can do all of those things. So uh, check them out on uh, Leo Crowdfunding. And of course, other crowdfunding sites are available. So check out crowdfunding as a way to diversify the way you uh, are investing. Yeah. Yeah, technology really playing such an important part there, isn't it? The, you mentioned the website there, which is bringing people together. And uh, Mark shared some of the tools that they're using as well. Some of those that we're using in Wealth Builders to make our yeah. life easier, to bring our team together, because mm. we're working remotely now as well. So it's not so easy just to turn over your shoulder and speak to someone. But, you know, tools now make it easy for people to work pretty much across the world and, and still be quite seamless in business. Absolutely. I think the other leverage is the when you get time back, and that's really quite a critical thing. And it's not one that Mark necessarily mentioned, but I'd, I'd like to mention it, that we encourage everybody who's on a wealth building journey with wealth builders to focus their way to income security so they get financially secure, which means essentially all their bills are paid for. And that brings time back into play because the great thief of wealth is time. Uh, we know that because people always say, oh, I haven't got time or I'm too busy in the work-life balance for the most successful people in work and in business is, is, is always that. And you, you see that played out in their, their work-life balance problems. But part of that in business is creativity. So creativity comes from having more time to allow you 
to intelligently look at what the problems are and then spend more time in creatively finding the solutions. Now, this particular one I've, I've spoken about before, Chris, and I, I love what they're doing is really identifying that the lifestyle choice that many people make to run a B&B or a small hotel, they get to a certain point, I suppose like they did in their car business, isn't it really? They get to a certain point when they're not really maximizing anymore. We all know that they'll often trade up to the VAT threshold to around 80 grand or so. And they don't want to go above that because they're quite comfortable. Well, Mark's talking about a quarter of a million for a property typically. So, yeah, you've got to just recognize that and say, well, there's a supply of people who get to a point in their life when they don't want to do it even 80 grand a year. They don't want to do it anymore. And that's a real skill where you can give a, a solution to them, whether it's to manage the property, as you mentioned, or alternatively to buy it from them, which could be a shared deal. It could be an outright purchase. It could be a lease option. Do you know what I mean? That creativity then to spend time with people. And I jokingly, uh, when I spoke to Mark, said, yeah, this is a really interesting strategy I call crusty people with crusty properties. You know, it's, it's like they're, they're getting to a point where things are not working as smoothly and as effectively. There's no technology. It's all old-fashioned. You know, there's no use of, uh, I think he used the word OTA, which is online travel agent. Uh, but that's a form of leverage because you're using uh, channels, uh, as we call them, through um, Airbnb and, and, and other channels are available, of course, as well. And, and that brings more people. But you could hear him say, well, we want the channels to bring us the initial inquiry, and then we want to nurture the client to to build further inquiries for the future. And I think all of this is is very, very smart thinking, and I commend the Fernieho family for how smart they've been in turning this into a, a good business and uh, looking to expand. So check them out. I mean, it could well be something you could learn from in your area. It doesn't have to be Cornwall. It could be you could learn the lessons they're learning in terms of leverage whether you're in Aberdeen or Aberystwyth, with Cardiff or Cleethorpes, you know, you could do the same thing. Absolutely. And uh, that tired business owner could be any type of business, right? Not just property. It's uh, Yeah, not just property. You know, yeah. And, I've, got, uh, I've got a client who is buying uh, franchises from people who are just getting too old to run them, you know. So you can look at age. Uh, age affects people's um, thoughts, you know, the health just the just the amount of energy uh, they need. All of these things uh, can affect someone's decision about whether they want to run a business. And you can solve a problem for a business owner or a property owner, uh, not by taking it off them and, and and almost taking advantage of people, but to give them a solution that they're looking for. In the same way as many landlords um, who are tired of their buy to let uh, process, for example. Um, many of our clients will take those properties under a rent to rent scheme and then turn them into an HMO or a student accommodation or a service accommodation or whatever it would be to get more leverage, to get more value. But it takes the problem away from somebody who doesn't want to face that problem anymore. And that's just smart thinking. Absolutely. Okay. So that covers off pretty much all of the lessons I think for today. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't forget, if you'd like to join us for that SAS webinar coming up on Tuesday, the 21st of February, then head to wealthbuilders.co.uk forward slash SAS webinar and uh, find out how you can make your pension work harder for you. So Kevin, we will catch up same time, same place next week. Indeed we will. And until then, my friend, see ya.